But we have a guest speaker today that uh, I've been looking forward to this. Uh, but it's not just Tomi and Noah Savini he's going to be talking about. Uh, he's going to be talking about the state park's history in, in general, and I won't ruin your surprises. But uh, Sam Wat Watipka. Okay, Sam Watipka. First time I've met him too, but we're anxious to have. He's the uh, exhibit development coordinator at the Washington State Parks and at the headquarters building here in Tumwater. So we want to welcome him. Born and raised in Portland area, so he's a, he's a Northwesterner. Um, but I've always loved our national parks. Our family's been uh, uh, camping in national parks since I was a kid and, uh, and for hiking too. But our state parks are also very, very popular as are the county and city parks too for that matter. But here in our county, we have two state parks, Tolme and miller Savinia. so he's gonna highlight each of those. Tolme doesn't have a very long history, but Sam will talk about that. And uh, so it's gonna be a real treat to hear from a historian in that department today. So let's uh, have a big welcome for Sam Watipka. Thank you, Don, and uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, like Don said, my name is uh, Sam Watipka. I'm the Exhibit Development Coordinator for the Washington State Parks and Recreation Commission, um, which is a system of about 126 parks, uh, give or take, across the state of Washington. Uh, my role in the agency is the planning, research, um, writing, design, and installation of um, exhibits in our visitor centers and museums. We have about 13 of those, um, and also outdoors. Um, as interpretive panels in our parks as well. Um, so I'm here today uh, specifically to talk about um, Tolme State Park um, up north of Lacey on the Puget Sound and Millersylvania State Park south of Tumwater on Deep Lake. Um, but I think the history of these two parks is probably best understood in the context of the development of Washington State Park System. So um, if you'll allow it, I will kind of um, give you a broader history of the state park system highlighting where Millersylvania and Tolme fit in um, to that 103 year long story. Um, so the state park idea um, in Washington can be attributed to a number of people, but the probably the most prominent um, of those people is Robert Moran, namesake of Moran State Park on Orcas Island. Um, Moran was um, a wealthy shipbuilder based out of Seattle. He was for a period of time the city's mayor as well. And he had an estate on Orcas Island that consisted of several thousand acres on the top of Mount Constitution. How many people here have been to Moran State Park? It's one of our flagships. Um, well, Moran had all this land, and he came up with this idea to give it to the state um, as a park. But there was a problem in that we had absolutely no agency that could accept citizen donations of land uh, for park purposes. And um, not only that, but we had no means of funding their preservation or their uh, maintenance. Um, and so Moran began advocating for the establishment of a state park board or agency to basically accept citizen donations of land uh, for parks. In 1913, um, House Bill 509 was um, introduced to the legislature, establishing a state park board and um, assigning various responsibilities and authorities. Um, it passed the House, it passed the Senate, and ultimately was signed by the governor on March 19th of 1913. Um, and that governor was um, Ernest Lister. Um, the governance of state parks was a little bit different back then. Um, the language of the bill made it such that the governor um, was the chair of the state parks board. Um, and so Governor Lister set forth his vision of state parks in Washington, and he said, I have been much impressed with the idea that a most desirable line to follow in connection with state parks would be to secure, by donation, small tracts of land along state highways. Now there's two key um, phrases in this uh, sentence here. One is, by donation, so we had no funding at that period of time. They established a state parks agency but assigned it no money. Um, so the idea was to accept citizen donations of land, um, and also small tracts of land along state highways. Um, the vision at this point in time for state parks was really um, rest spots of beauty uh, was the term that got thrown around a lot. So basically places for motorists to stop, you know, get out of their cars, go to the bathroom, maybe have a picnic and then continue on their way. Little pieces of land, nothing um, large like what Moran was proposing. And so he did all this work to create this agency um, and then they didn't um, actually want his land uh, for a number of years later. 
Um, so we were established in 1913. It took about two years for the first state park to come into the system. That was Larrabee State Park on Chuckanut Drive near Bellingham. How many people have been to Larrabee? A lot of, a lot of people in the audience. Great. It's a beautiful park. Um, that was our very first state park. At the time, it was just about 30 acres um, of land donated by Charles Xavier Larrabee. Um, in 1913, and at that same time, we also received the Jackson Courthouse, um, now known as Jackson House State Park Heritage Site, um, which is a homestead cabin built by John and Matilda Jackson in the 1840s. How many people have been there? This is along the Jackson Highway, just south of Chehalis. Is that a question? Or, okay. Oh, who didn't get the memo about cell phones? Um, so at that same at that same meeting, um, we 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 got Jackson Courthouse, um, 1913, and this again was a citizen donation of land to the state, small little parcel to be used as a rest spot of beauty. Um, now, 1921, a new vision um, was established for state parks um, in House Bill 164, um, which gave us our first appropriation and gave our agency um, specific powers to. Um, basically operate concessions, charge fees, um, basically raise revenue to operate a system, hire things like caretakers, um, build picnic shelters and facilities. Um, so it wasn't a whole lot of money, it was just about $30,000, but it was enough for us to begin not just having parks, but also operating them. And so that, yeah, that came, that was passed on March 19th of 1921. So um, about eight years later, um, after the establishment of the agency, Moran State Park did um, ultimately open. It was one of our first parks. Um, and after that, things really started rolling. In 1922, we got Lewis and Clark State Park, which is actually very near the Jackson House State Park, um, south of Chehalis along the Jackson Highway. Um, this is a concessionaire operating Lewis and Clark. Um, we, we got Tolney, or sorry, Tuano State Park um, in 1923. Um, 1924, Schaefer State Park um, out near Montesano along Highway 8. And also in 19, whoops, a little too far. Also in 1924, um, we received Millersylvania State Park, which was a citizen donation um, from Frederick Jacob Xenophon Miller. <laughs> quite, quite the name. <laughs> um, and Mr. Miller was born in 1848 um, in the eastern United States to John and Anna. The family ultimately moved to Thurston County in 1881 and they began purchasing land around Deep Lake, uh, which is the lake that Millersylvania set along. They bought out a number of homestead claims that had been established from the 1850s onward. Um, and over the course of time, they ended up owning about 700 acres alongside the, um, the lake. Um, and in the territorial census of 1887, John was listed as a farmer, and Frederick, who had been educated at Stanford, um, was, was listed as a teacher. Now, there's not a lot that we know with certainty, um, at least at state parks, about the Miller family. Um, there's a lot of um, rumors and myths and innuendo, um, but not a lot has been established as fact. Um, the, the entire family is buried at Masonic Memorial Park in Tumwater, um, which is part of that uh, cemetery uh, along, um, oh, what road is it there? Along the Yelm Highway. Um, so the, the whole family is buried there, John and Anna, and their three children, Christina, Matilda, or, uh, Matilda and Frederick. Um, and none of, the, none of these three children that they have ever married or ever had children. So this is, this is the whole family right there. Um, but like I said, there was a lot of there's a lot of folklore and myth around the family that they were descended from Austrian royalty and had to flee the country um, after a, after a battle was lost. But um, none of it has ever really been proven um, to be to be fact. All we know is that they emigrated to the United States um, in the 1820s or 1830s and ultimately moved to Thurston County in 1881. Um, so Frederick. Um, he died in 1921, and within his will, he deeded the entire family estate to, to Washington for use as a park. 
Um, and the park he stipulated would be named Miller Sylvania, which literally means Miller Forest Land. And so here's the park just a few years after that, in probably the early 1930s. Um, now to go back to our, our history of state parks, this is Deception Pass State Park, Rosario Beach, um, which opened in 1925. Um, this is Rosario Beach again. In 1928, um, the Vista House at Sun Lakes Dry Falls State Park was constructed. That was kind of our first facility. You have to remember at this time we had almost no money, so we weren't really building things. We were really just stewarding the land. And things were going really well. Here's the system as of about 1928. As you can see, we've got about 25 parks um, around the state. Um, and, and things were really going well for us. Um, but then, um, Roland Hartley was elected um, in 1925, and after um, at the beginning of his second term, he decided um, that he had a different vision for state parks. He said, these parks were set aside in order to preserve some natural beauty spots untouched by civilization and the greed of man. They were never intended for tourist camps and amusement parks. And so with that, um, Governor Hartley vetoed our entire budget uh, for 1920, 1929 to 1931, and we had no money at all, and um, consequently we closed um, almost every park in the system, including Miller Sylvania. It was, it was a rough period for us, but you know, we've always had our ups and downs. Um, this, this was probably a low point. Um, and so this was a state of state parks in 1930. Yes, is that a question? When you say closed, does that mean that the state sold the land? No, they pretty much just mothballed them. Okay. Um, which wasn't hard to do at that time because um, most of these places were very rustic. Um, you know, they didn't have paved roads, they didn't have running water, they didn't have toilets, bathhouses, you know, most of them didn't have roads. Uh, we pretty much just, you know, put up a sign that said closed. Okay. Um, and the remaining five parks were operated by concessionaires. And that's a question in the back. Was the governor's move to close all these parks predicated at all by the Depression? Um, may well have been. Um, you know, money was a bit scarce starting in 1929. Um, <laughs> and so the state may have had higher priorities. Um, and that's a good segue into uh, my next point here is um, what really changed things for us was the election of 1932. Now, I won't dwell on this because I imagine everybody's tired of talking about elections <laughs> at this point. Um, but it was a transformational moment for our state park system and, of course, for the nation as a whole. Um, President Roosevelt came sweeping into power with the near sweep of the Electoral College. Um, and he immediately set to work um, establishing programs to combat the effects of the Great Depression. He created the Federal Emergency Relief Administration, which was basically an agency designed to generate employment. Um, and Harry L. Hopkins was made the director of that agency. Um, and at the same time, we also got new leadership in Washington. Um, Governor Clarence Martin was elected, um, and Secretary of State Ernest Hutchinson became the uh, chair of the State Parks Board. Now, both uh, Martin and Hutchinson advocated very effectively for federal relief funds specifically for our state park system. And what we ended up with was a number of um, federal relief work programs established in state parks across Washington, um, both civilian conservation core camps in about um, a dozen of our parks, as well as uh, uh, works progress administration camps or projects um, in other parks. Now, Civilian Conservation Corps, as many of you may know, was a, basically a work program designed to employ young men ages 18 to 25, where they were paid a small amount of money and put to work on public lands across the country, not just state parks, but national parks, fire control, building dams. A lot of major infrastructure projects, especially in the western United States, were um, done by the Civilian Conservation Corps, um, as well as the Works Progress Administration, which had a different focus, which was employing um, out of work, um, working, you know, professionals, adult men mostly, um, and tradesmen. And so this was really the transformational moment for state parks. Like I said, we really had no facilities, um, even when we had our small appropriation. Um, these were very rustic sites, um, but this infusion of both money and manpower from the federal government that came uh, 
as part of the New Deal program really allowed us to kind of unlock the potential of all these lands that we had begun to acquire. And so they built things like roads. Um, this is the Audrey Wright Park, right? Riverside State Park. Um, and a road being constructed at Ginkgo Petrified Forest near Vantage, Washington. Um, they were building community shelters and picnic shelters um, like these, which are all, by the way, still here. You can go visit all these structures. There. Um, we've, we've preserved them. Um, bathrooms, bathhouses, basic visitor facilities. Um, that we just didn't have at that point. Trails, bridges, and also some very iconic structures that are still in our system today as well, like the um, Ginkgo Petrified Forest Interpretive Center, uh, Ginkgo State Park, and the Mount Constitution Lookout Tower at Moran State Park were both projects undertaken by Civilian Conservation Corps workers. And Millsylvania was um, one of about a dozen camps or uh, parks that had civilian conservation corps camps. Um, each camp had about 200 men. They served in six month periods of time. They were paid $30 a month, um, $25 a month, which had to be sent home to their families, um, and $5 that they got to keep for themselves. The, the wages, of course, weren't very much even at that time, but the main, uh, the main benefit for them was food, shelter, and marketable skills. Um, they were taught how to, you know, construct buildings and um, operate machinery. Um, and these were mostly men from the East Coast who had really had no employment in their whole lives. They were, you know, basically kids um, that were shipped across the country and put to work um, in America's public lands in the West Coast. Oops. And all the buildings, or at least many of the buildings, um, in the Civilian Conservation Corps camps were actually repurposed army, um, army buildings. World War I had ended and they were basically putting to use all these surplus materials, uniforms, uh, buildings, cots. Yes? Did a lot of the, many of the CCC people stay, stay in this area? Or Absolutely. Um, oh yes, I mean, you know, I, I don't have any statistics on that, but I imagine a number of people here probably have family who served in the Civilian Conservation Corps locally. Um, it was pretty common for people to basically come from the East Coast, join the Civilian Conservation Corps over here and stay. Now, there were people from Washington who were put to work in the Civilian Conservation Corps and Works Progress Administration and other um, New Deal programs as well, but at that point of time, the most of the population and most of the unemployment in the United States was on the East Coast in New York, New Jersey, Boston, all the big cities there. Um, and all the work that needed to be done was in the western United States. Um, and so there was a you know, big process of basically shipping people across the country to put them to work over here. Um, and so the work was jointly um, supervised by the National Park Service, which basically determined what work needed to be done, what types of facilities, um, what the look of the buildings should be, how the circulation of the roads should be, all that sort of stuff. And then um, the camps were administered by basically the Army. Um, so here's a quick case study of Miller Sylvania State Park. This is the entrance um, before the Civilian Conservation Corps camp really got started in December of 1933. Um, they began building a caretaker's home. Um, here they are laying the foundation. And all this work, I should mention, was done by hand for the most part. They had you know, no power tools. Um, they were cutting down trees. Uh, peeling the logs um, and really building things from the ground up with, you know, very rudimentary hand tools. Um, all the all the materials were locally sourced. as Tonino sandstone for the most part that you'll see in the park over there, and most of the trees came from the land within the park or nearby. Here you can see the caretaker's house and garage, um, just about complete, um, with work still to be done on the road. Burning in the um, lettering for the entrance sign there. And so here we are in 1933 again, and here we are in 1936, uh, about three years later. And so a lot of this is still there. The entrance arch ultimately had to go because it was too low for um, larger vehicles. Um, and, but the caretaker's house is still there. I'm sure many of you have seen it as you, right as you drive into the park. 
Um, now, this wasn't the only project that Civilian Conservation Corps undertook um, at Miller Sylvania. Uh, before they showed up, the lake was a lot swampier, it didn't have very defined shorelines, so they actually lowered the level of the lake quite a bit by digging a ditch towards Scott Lake nearby and draining uh, the lake um, into, that, into that lake. Um, which lowered the water level and allowed them to create the swim beach that uh, many of you have probably used there. Um, that, that swim beach is not entirely natural. They basically built it. Um, they built a number of picnic shelters that are all along that shoreline of the lake. Um, and, you know, chimneys for the, for the um, large, um, the larger picnic shelter. Um, as well as the two bathhouses that are along the shoreline there. And a number of fire circles, one of which is still there um, if you go if you go walk through that part of the park. Now, the Civilian Conservation Corps basically came to an end with the onset of World War II. Uh, the manpower um, and resources were needed elsewhere, and so that was kind of the end of the Civilian Conservation Corps. Um, at the time, and as World War II was going on, and you know, through the 1940s, not a whole lot happened with state parks. We had these brand new facilities, and they worked well for us. Uh, but the nation's and state's energies were focused elsewhere. And really, the only major thing to occur during this period of time was a study that was conducted by the Washington Planning Council. And this study was of the parks across the state. And the study made a number of recommendations which um, really guided the direction of state parks in the future. Um, and the key recommend, or one of the key recommendations in, in this um, study was that Washington State Parks should make an effort to acquire, while it was still possible, sites of historic significance all across the state. Um, and by the, in, in the 1950s, we began to do this. And so we had a very rapid period of expansion where we were acquiring sites of historic and natural and geologic significance all across the state. This is Fort Columbia State Park um, near the mouth of the Columbia River. Um, this uh, Spokane Plains Battlefield uh, near Spokane. Fort Simcoe along the Yak on the Yakima Reservation, which is an 1850s era fort um, that's in very uh, pristine condition. Fort Casey State Park, a uh, coastal fortification, one of several that we own in the northern Puget Sound. And so in the um, late 40s, this is what we had in terms of sites of historic or geologic significance. And by 1967, you know, we had expanded very rapidly uh, to the point where we had dozens of sites um, I'm sure you've been to many of them, Dry Falls and Steptoe Battlefield and um, Sacagawea, an English camp and American camp, which were at that point state parks. They're now managed by the National Park Service. So the next big wave for state parks um, came during the 60s and 70s. Um, we didn't have a whole lot of visitors through the 1950s, about 1 1.6 million in 1950. Uh, by 1960, that number had jumped to 7.1 million. And uh, by 1970, that number had more than doubled to 20 million. And so things got a little crowded. Uh, this is a photo of Sacagawea State Park in the 1960s. That's the main parking lot there. And as you can see, we've got more than twice as many cars as we can possibly handle. Um, things really started to get overrun. We just simply didn't have enough parks um, we didn't have enough facilities in the parks that we had. We didn't have enough parking in the parks that we had to accommodate the swelling population of the state and the really growing user base. So we built things like cabins and retreat centers um, and boat launches and moorage facilities and docks to try to accommodate uh, more users. But we also began to get more parks. And it was during this period of time that Tolmy State Park came into the system. In 1961, we began uh, acquiring what was then known as the Jones Beach property. Um, we acquired it in a number of parcels of the, over the course of several years. And this park was really shoreline access to Puget Sound. We didn't acquire it because of its historic significance or necessarily because of its you know, spectacular scenic qualities. 
was because shoreline in the Puget Sound is very rare. Even today, um, about 20, only 20% 20 of the shoreline of Puget Sound is in public ownership. And at that time, it was a lot, um, lot smaller. And the same goes for the Washington coast. We were acquiring as much beach and shoreline access as we possibly could because we knew that the price of that was only going to go up and this was our chance to provide enough um, access to these resources uh, for a growing population. And so Tolmy came into the system as part of that wave. Uh, the park opened in 1965 um, and it was named after William Fraser Tolmy in 1972. However, um, so far as we can tell, the direct connection to Dr. Tolmy is unclear. Um, <laughs> You know, generally we try to name state parks for, um, you know, geographic or significant features or people um, within the boundaries of that park. Um, Tolmy, for whatever reason, was named for a figure of regional significance. Tolmy certainly had a lot of influence um, in the, you know, DuPont, Lakewood, Nisqually, uh, Olympia, Tumwater region. Uh, but as far as specifically at the land that now comprises Tolmy State Park, um, we're not 100% we're not sure. Um, so I'll give you a quick overview on Dr. Tolmy. I don't pretend to be an expert on his life or um, fur trading era history in the state. My expertise is mostly in state parks. Uh, but with that being said, um, Tolmy was born in Scotland in 1812. He um, received education at a very young age in medicine, but ultimately decided to join the Hudson Bay Company and move to the Pacific Northwest. Um, and came here and went back and then came back again where he was appointed um, as the director of Fort Nisqually, um, a post he served at from 1843 to 1859. Um, and it wasn't so much his activities as the um, leader of Fort Nisqually, although those were important, um, it was that he was a key figure in the development of the region and was known especially for his um, study of both native languages and botany. Um, his observations and writings and recordings are some of our earliest knowledge of the Lachutzi language, which is spoken by a number of tribes um, in the region, and also the plant life um, and plant cover of the region before it was significantly developed. And because of this, um, Tolmy has had a number of things named after him, as you may well know. Um, there's Tolmy Peak near Mount Rainier. There's Mount Tolmy on Vancouver Island, uh, Tolmy Street in Vancouver, BC, <laughs> Tolmy Saxophrane, which is a um, small flower, um, Tolmy Star Tulip, another small flower uh, named after Tolmy because he was one of the first people to record it, um, Tolmy's Onion, um, Simon Fraser, um, which was one of Tolmy's sons, um, is the namesake of Simon Fraser University. Um, the Fraser River. He was a um, one of the first premiers of uh, British Columbia, and of course, Tolmy State Park. Um, and so that's um, that's Tolmy in Pennsylvania, and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Um, I guess I can't say with, with certainty. I know there were civilian conservation corps camps and other sorts of um, New Deal programs that touch state park systems on the East Coast, uh, but there wasn't really the same undeveloped land base over there. Um, so that's why you see, you know, Washington, California, Oregon, Texas, uh, Colorado. Um, these are the, the states that have, you know, very elaborate, large state park systems with a lot of uh, civilian conservation corps. Um, Great Depression period development. And then the other question I wanted to ask you about was uh, when they came and began building here, mm -hmm. cutting down trees and so forth, did they use people from the forestry industry that was here then to train them? Absolutely, yeah. I think one thing I forgot to mention is that in addition to being supervised by the Army and the National Park Service, um, Civilian Conservation Corps camps were also run under the auspices of what were called local experienced men. Um, so they would basically take 
out of work uh, local craftsmen who had you know skills ranging from um, law, you know timber framing to masonry um, and put them to work supervising uh, the young men who are being uh, put to work there. Yes? So some other states have had some complications for funding for state parks like California and oh, certainly. so on that are privatized and so on. What's the status for Washington parks? Well, that's a complicated question. Um, I can, what I can say is that, you know, as many of you may know, most of our funding was taken away in 2013. Um, when the Discover Pass, which hopefully most of you have now, um, was implemented, the idea was that state parks should be self-funding for the most part, and they took away almost all of our state funding and said, raise the revenue yourselves. Um, that's why we have the you know, $30 annual pass or $10 day pass, and it's why camping prices have, of course, gone up, and um, we're looking to generate revenue in other ways. So right now, only about 15% uh, of our funding comes from general fund monies. The rest of it is... Uh, raised by our other means. So we're certainly, um, we have a more stable source of funding now that we're generating it mostly ourselves, but um, the legislature can still have a pretty big effect um, by taking away that remaining 15 to 20 percent that uh, comes from appropriated funds. Yes? I have a question about Federation Forest State Park. Sure. It's a beautiful park with lots of really cool trails, but yes. it was hit so badly mm -hmm. with that storm uh, last last year, mm -hmm. and it's a mess, and I don't know is there, what are the chances that with the trails, there are just huge tr trees down. Mm -hmm. is, there, is there a plan to fix that? Yeah, we do have, um, we've, we've hired a staff person at that park. Um, previously, it, w it really didn't have any single dedicated staff, so in the last year, we have actually hired someone there who's uh, been working on maintaining those trails. I don't know what their um, current status is as of right now. Um, but it should be improving. Yes? Oh, where was this park that you... Oh, Federation Forest. Um, Federation Forest is an old growth uh, park along Highway 410 on the way to Mount Rainier oh. on the Chinook Scenic oh. Byway. Um, it's east of Enumclaw and Buckley. Okay. Beautiful park um, if you're into lowland old growth forest. Yes? Uh, in 1960, uh, another fellow and myself uh, swam across the lake at Miller Savannah mm -hmm. Park with scuba gear on the bottom. Oh, God. And it was a mess. I'm sure. <laughs> uh, and, and, I mean, there was trees in there. Uh, uh, the bottom was all mucky and muddy. Mm -hmm. But the big thing that bothered me was that there was so many trees on the bottom. Uh, has anything been done to, for these kind of parks uh, to, to keep keep the bottom of the lakes and things cleaned up? Um, that's not something I think I can really answer adequately. I would say that we generally manage lakes, you know, to be natural. So if, you know, there were naturally occurring trees in the bottom of lakes, we probably wouldn't remove them uh, for the most part unless they posed a significant hazard to boaters or recreational users. Uh, but that's a little bit outside my area of expertise. In this case, it would only be to scuba divers, and you got to right. pay attention. In this case. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, in the mid 1960s, my brother worked at Easton. In oh, the Lake United Easton. States, yep. And I and I don't remember if that was like a CCC program or if there was. It has there ever been a, a redoing of that program, or is there any idea? Well, that's a really good point. Um, although the Civilian Conservation Corps did end in 1942 with the onset of World War II, um, it established a, a model that has continued to be used by a variety of um, both governmental programs and non-governmental programs ever since, basically the Service Corps model, um, where you're essentially paying usually younger people very nominal wages in exchange for community service. Um, so this is the model that the Peace Corps is built on. This is the model that AmeriCorps is built on. And um, the AmeriCorps is certainly present in a number of our parks. During the 1960s, we had what was called the Youth Development Conservation Corps, I think it was, um, which put uh, young people to work in Washington, in state parks and other state-owned public lands. So while the Civilian Conservation Corps um, no longer exists, um, programs built on that model exist nationally and within Washington. In the very back. Um, you mentioned the Larrabee State Park. Yes. Yes. And just to bring that full circle, he was a very good friend and a business associate of the Schmidt family. 
Oh, really? Um, well, yeah, Larrabee was a very, um, you know, very influential figure in um, not only Montana, where he was originally from, but in uh, Washington and Oregon as well. Um, there's a lot of um, things that bear his name or bear his mark. And that park just turned 101, or well, 100 years old, and is going to turn 101 in five days. Where is it? Um, on Chuckanut Highway, uh, just south of Bellingham, Washington. In the front? Um, it's going better. Um, <laughs> certainly when they, it was first brought in um, in 2013, sales um, were far less than projected. Um, and so with that, we had park closures, we had staff layoffs, we had um, reductions in service all across the system. Um, since then, sales have been steadily growing. They continue to tick up and up each year, and we've been also making more money off things like camping and cabins and yurts. Um, so it's, it's stabilizing um, and improving, but perhaps not exactly where we want it to be just yet. A question somewhere in the middle. Yes? Yeah, there's a new cabin out at Miller Sylvania. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that? I just... Um, well, there's a number of new things at Miller Sylvania. I, you know, I work in our educational program, so I don't... Um, get as involved with infrastructure developments. But yeah, Miller Sylvania right now, they, they have put in a number of new cabins, um, as well as they've, I believe, established glamping um, with the concessionaire, which is basically platform tents um, with nice beds inside of them that people pay extra money for. We're doing a lot of different things to try to generate more revenue, um, that included. Yes? How many total parks do we have now? Um, 125 developed state parks. Um, in addition to that, we have um, about 10 marine state parks, which are um, basically small islands like Eagle Island or Hope Island. Um, and we have um, historical state parks. We have about a dozen of those and heritage sites, um, about another dozen of those, give or take. Um, in addition to these, we have maybe another 100 or so undeveloped properties um, that are basically being held for future development. One is the Nisqually State Park. Um, which is along, um, just kind of past Yelm, um, along the way to Mount Rainier, and um, Elbow Lake State Park property, which is also out in that direction. Neither of them have had really any substantial development. Yes? I was just at a retreat a few weeks ago at the Miller Sylvania Environmental Learning Center. Mm -hmm. Do any of the other state parks have those types of learning centers? Because that was really cool. Uh, yeah, there's about 10, give or take. Um, Deception Pass, Moran, um, Miller Sylvania, um, several others. Um, yeah. Yes. Do you have uh, hostess for these different camps? Hosts. People, people that volunteer. Yes. I'm glad you asked. Um, <laughs> I think there's a number of people here who are of retirement age, um, and um, we do. We rely very much on volunteers and um, our campgrounds and environmental learning centers. Um, mostly rely on hosts. <laughs> who basically stay in their RVs for free there for a month at a time in exchange for helping operate those sites. Is there any training at all? Yes. Yes, there is. I wanted to ask about Fort Canby. There's a really nice Lewis and Clark ex exhibit there. Is that something the state parks let somebody else build and, and operate, or is that something the parks actually... Well, that is something, uh, yes, we did. Our program, uh, my program, the interpretive program, did. That was, um, that's what you're referring to as the Lewis and Clark Interpretive Center at Cape Disappointment State Park, which did used to be known as Fort Canby State Park, um, but it's certainly one of our flagship facilities. Good job. Where Thank you. That? Where is that park? Um, at the mouth of the Columbia River. On the Washington side. In Iwako. <laughs> yes, in the front. Is the Folsom Museum part of the state park system there? No, but you know, that's a, I, I'm glad you brought that up because um, that's a good question. Let's see if I can find that. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's see. Oops, oh, come on. Not from the beginning. Well, we'll get there. Um, the point is, not all state parks stay state parks. We've had a lot of parks come and go. Um, through the years, Polson actually being one of them. I don't know about the museum specifically, but 
Um, at one point in time, we did have a Polson um, State Park um, near, it's there in Hoquiam, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, um, it was on one of the slides there on the map. Right. Um, oh, come on. <laughs> there we go. So, yeah, Polson um, was a state park that is no more, so is Wormald and Mailer and Rigney. Uh, most of these are now being managed by other, um, other organizations. Um, we decided they didn't fit our system and transfer them to counties or cities or nonprofits. No wonder I couldn't find it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is that where that Polson Museum is in, in Polson? I believe so. I can't say for can't say for sure. That was the uh, uh, logging family. Is that correct? Right. Right. Yeah. 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 It's an interesting tour. If nobody's been there, it, it's a it's a good tour. Yes. Is your communication good or bad, or what's the extent of it with the national park system? Um, it varies. Um, our role as state parks, you know, national parks are much larger, um, big destinations, and we have a lot of parks that are kind of on the margins of uh, national parks, like Federation Forest or Racer State Park or um, Bogachiel State Park. We have parks that are kind of positioned at the outskirts of national parks so that people can camp there or stay there before they venture off into the national parks for several days at a time. And so. Where appropriate, we try to partner with national parks um, in kind of our communication strategies or orientation strategies. Yeah. Anyone else? Well, thank you, Sam. Thank you. You're a hit. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Our next talk will be December 13th, or no, excuse me, 15th, and um, here we are, Thurston County's oldest community in Tumwater. We're celebrating with the newest city, Lacey. They have their 50th anniversary, and so their birthday party, we're going to have, have them come speak here at the Schmidt House next month. So, yes, yeah, set aside December 15th, and that's two days after Bob Crim's next house tour, which is on the 13th. So we Thank you.